armas nucleares são usadas com frequência nas guerras contemporâneas. E além de causarem morte e destruição em massa, para os que sobrevivem, elas representam um risco de contaminação pela radioatividade. Hoje você vai conhecer histórias de pessoas que foram contaminadas pelo contato com essas armas, no documentário Cobaias Nucleares. We were just on an open hillside facing ground zero and just before the shot was dropped from an airplane they told us to turn around and put your hands behind your head put your knees up you know and put your head between your knees and that we did and you could you could just feel like a blowtorch going across the back of your neck when the blast went off we got out of our trenches and foxholes and had a simulated attack on ground zero. When I got out of my foxhole, the sandbags were burning and the uh, sand was spun to glass like, like ice. No, I uh, didn't have any worries whatsoever. When you're 22, uh, heck, you, you think you're expensive, <laughs> so I didn't. Didn't think a thing about it till it got to five. And then I started, like I said, crouching down. Most people talk about it, and it's just something that happened. And unless you talk to some of the other fellas that's been on through a shot or something like that, that really knows what's happened. Uh, I don't think the outside world realizes what it really is. I was drafted into the Army in 1951, January of 1951, and I went down to the Nevada desert in uh, October of 1951 to participate in the uh, Buster Jangle series of uh, nuclear tests. Up until that time, nuclear weapons had been delivered uh, with airplanes, and the war in Korea was going on, and so they had anticipated use, the use of uh, smaller nuclear weapons, or, that is, tactical nuclear weapons, ones that could be delivered by uh, artillery shell, for example. And they wanted to know whether uh, soldiers would be able to continue uh, fighting under under that kind of situation. They had a whole scenario written down, you know, the Russians had invaded and come ashore in, in uh, either Northern California or Oregon or Washington and were, were driving south and, and east and, uh, you know, it was just all of their, the games that the Pentagon plays, or that they love to play. I was a mechanic and driver in A Company of the 231st Combat Engineer Battalion, which was the uh, organization responsible for building the animal pens and, and retrieving the uh, de demolished and destructed, the destroyed equipment at the test site and preparing the test site for the various tests. Uh, 
the the men were brought up from from uh, Camp Desert Rock, put in the trenches, and told to turn around. And when the bomb went off, they were told to to turn back around to to watch to, to observe the mushroom cloud as it uh, as it went up into the air. And then they were brought out of the trenches and marched towards Ground Zero. We were stationed where we could hear the countdown, and so we'd fall out early in the morning and the sun would be coming up, and we'd be waiting to see if we could see the airplane and, or to hear the airplane as it, as it came over to, uh, to see if we could see this thing while it, if, while it was falling. And we were told to turn our backs because we didn't uh, have glasses or any protective eye gear. And uh, the, the countdown would begin. And then uh, when the explosion went off, the, the entire desert lit up like uh, a, a brighter than daylight. And the, everything stood out in, in uh, bright relief. You know, the, the yucca plants and the, and the sagebrush and, and those kinds of things were just so vivid. And it was, if, if you've been to the test site and you know where Yucca Flat is, it's kind of a large basin. And this whole basin just lit up with, uh, with light. It was uh, an awe-inspiring uh, event. When I left the test site, I knew that as human beings, we had the ability to destroy ourselves. And I've been thinking about that ever since 1951. And, uh, you know, if, and if saner heads uh, don't prevail, we're going to do it, seems to me. I didn't volunteer to go out and be a guinea pig. Originally, they said, they, they picked out some in each company that was there. They said, well, you, you're due for orientation March 16th at 2 o'clock. You're going to witness atomic explosion. They made me sign a paper. I guess it was some kind of release, but if I, you know, they couldn't make you go, but if you didn't go, you could be court-martialed. So I signed it and went. We went to what they had, the canteen tent, and there was a captain and colonel giving us a rundown a little bit what was going to happen. He said, in no way would we put you in harm's way, he said, so they asked, you know, how much radiation are we going to get? He said, oh, it'd be a, probably a little less than a regular chest x-ray. I mean, everybody looked around and kind of, you know, snickered. We knew better than that. But anyway, that, that morning of the 17th, we got in buses and trucks. It was, it was still dark. This was about 4 o'clock in the morning, and we went about 25 miles to the forward area. And I think the blast was detonated at 5.20, and it was still dark. It was, it was an open shot, and we were 2,500 yards from ground zero in a foxhole with, with no protective gear whatsoever. They told us to crouch down and keep our eyes closed and put our hands over our eyes. But when the blast went off, it was, you know, brighter than day. And I peeked a little bit, and I could see the bones in my hand. And then the shock wave went over us, and then it hit off of a mountain, and the back blast was worse than the, the original 